Okay, so um, hello everyone. Hopefully you can see my screen. Welcome to our uh, first webinar of two this week. So hopefully you've all joined the right webinar. We are today presenting on some of our brilliant project partners work. So this is our first webinar where we're going to hear some of the findings and recommendations over the work that they've been doing in the last six months. So I'm just going to give you a little bit of a recap um, and a reminder and set, set some context for you for the wider project. So I'm Bobby Townsend, so I am the communications manager on the UKRI Net Zero Digital Research Infrastructure Scoping Project. It's a mouthful, so um, that's the wider project. So I'll just give a little bit of an update about the wider project and then I'll hand over to our partners. Okay, so housekeeping, boring stuff, get it out of the way. Um, if you could all stay muted, you're doing a brilliant job of that whilst the speakers are presenting. Um, but if you'd like to have your video on, that's, that's fine. It's nice to see some faces behind the, the blank screens, but if you don't want to, that's also fine. Um, we're going to do questions at the end of each individual project partner talk, but we're only going to give a couple of minutes for those. And those will just be kind of clarification questions. So if you have a question which is more for maybe deeper discussion or for several of the speakers, we're going to deal with that in a discussion at the end. Um, and um, I'll facilitate the questions, but you can either use the raise hand function, which is a button at the bottom of your screen, or you can use the Zoom chat and I can read it out. Um, so as you can see, this webinar is being recorded. If you don't want to be recorded, then stay muted with your video off and you will not be shown. So um, just a, a introduction of the wider team as part of the scoping project. These are all the faces behind the core team. Um, I, there's lots of names that I recognise. There's some new faces as well, but we're the people behind the, the project in general. So we are all based at the Centre for Environmental Data Analysis, or CEDA. Um, and yeah, we're really interested in finding out who's here today. So if you want to say hello in the chat, then please do. OK, so the agenda for the webinar, I'm going to give a really quick recap about um, kind of where we are today in a bit of context setting. Then we're going to have some presentations from a selection of our project partners. They're going to share some of their findings and recommendations so far. We're then going to have some time for discussion and I'll do a couple of slides to wrap up and explain what the next steps are in the wider project. Okay, so just to recap and as a reminder, so what is digital research infrastructure? This, this is the whole basis of what our scoping project is about. So this is um, a screenshot from UKRI's website, which explains what digital research infrastructure is. But it can be thought of as anything from large scale computing facilities like supercomputers um, to long term data storage facilities, but it can also range from things like uh, the software or the analysis packages that researchers use to analyze data. And there's other things as well, like how to access the supercomputers maybe or how to access the data. So all of, all of these systems are included in the wider um, infrastructure. And then finally, it also includes the people. So the people who use all of these different infrastructures and the experts who um, make sure that they keep running and are usable by the users. So our project ambition has kind of three aims to it. So we um, are collecting evidence to inform future investment decisions for the digital research infrastructure across all of UK research and innovation. We are also providing UKRI and the wider community with an outline roadmap for how we can actually get to net zero by 2040 within just the digital research infrastructure space. And then finally, we want to enable UKRI to be able to play a positive and leading role in the transition to a net zero, net zero future. OK, so I said we're collecting evidence, but um, we're doing this in lots of different ways. So one of the ways that you're going to hear about the evidence that's been collected through the project is today by some of our wonderful project partners. But there's lots of other other um, 
threads of the project going on behind the scenes as well. So this slide is just trying to summarise a few, a few of the different uh, activities that were undertaken. So the project partners have done a lot of their work and they're going to show you their findings today. We've done a big literature survey, so that's um, available in our interim report, which is all shared on our website. And then the next stage of the project that we're working on now is kind of an engagement stage. So we're holding lots of meetings and events and gathering feedback on the recommendations and evidence that we've collected so far. As I said, we've got lots of project partners. Here's a logo soup of, um, that shows you where everyone is based. I think we've got about 40 individual researchers that we're working with across from across 20 different institutions. So we've got a huge range of experience working with us, which is great. And we're going to hear from um, some of these experts in the webinars today and on Thursday this week. So this slide is just trying to show you roughly how the project partners um, all fit together. So you can think of the green box at the top as um, sub projects which fit into a theme, machines and workflows, or kind of technical and operational um, projects. So that's the theme of webinar one. And then the ones at the bottom fall within the theme of people and processes. So that's what we will be talking about in webinar two. And the main other difference in these projects is how they were funded. So the projects on the left hand side were new ideas from the community. So these were funded via some sample events, which were an open call to the community that um, anyone could come and uh, gain funding from us for. And the ones on the right are consortium projects. So these are ideas that were initiated by us in the core team or in the original proposal. And we've gone out and asked experts in the community um, uh, to, to come and work with us. OK, so that's a very quick overview of the project so far. This is by no means all of what's been going on, but I'm going to leave it there and hand over to our speakers in just a second. So today we are focusing on technical and operational challenges. And these are our speakers today with the rough um, running order. So each talk is 10 minutes and we've got two minutes for questions after each one. I'm gonna try and be strict because otherwise we're not gonna have enough time for discussion at the end. So speakers, um, I apologise if I cut into your talk and tell you that you're running out of time in advance. So yeah, if we can remember that we're being strict with time, that would be great. And then after we've heard from all of our speakers, we'll have time for a wider discussion and um, some more slides about next steps. Okay, so I'm gonna stop sharing now and I think I'm gonna hand over to my first speaker, which will be Dan from the Carbon Quandary Project. Thank you, Poppy. We've got Dan. We do. Phew. Hi. I'll try <laughs> to. Um, I'll try to share my screen. Let's see if yep. how that works. If you can see this, the presenter nodes or the main screen. What can you see at the moment? Do you see the? We we can see the one that you want us to see. So that's perfect now. Fantastic. Um, thank you very much um, for allowing me to to speak today. I'm. Uh, presenting the work carried out in the project Carbon Quandary, quantifying the carbon emissions of digital research infrastructure. I'm part of a fabulous team, including Noah Silberman at the University of Oxford, and I've seen her. Uh, she's she's here in the in the, in the chat, um, and maybe she can uh, say a few words later on as well. Um, then also uh, part of our team was David Greenwood, or is David Greenwood from the, from Newcastle University? I haven't seen him. Um, but um, I'm, I'm looking forward to, to present the fantastic work that he's done and his team. And also Alistair Dewhurst, and I haven't seen him as well, but um, some of you from STFC might know him. Um, what I'm presenting today are preliminary findings. Um, I think some of this is um, it's already interesting uh, in itself, but um, we've got a, uh, an extension to continue with the work and the analysis of all the models that we have created until the middle of March. And, and um, I'm happy to give you an update when this comes out. Now, this the title of the project is Quantifying the Carbon Emissions of Digital Research Infrastructure. But of course, the objective is um, after the quantification to understand what we can do about it. So the goal is to, to, to support the decarbonization. Um, but before we can decarbonize, we need to understand um, 
we want to we want to have a quantitative um, angle to 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 understanding and prioritizing those decarbonization options. Um, that's a, yeah, that works okay. Um, so the context within which we were working was the tier one data center at the Rutherford Appleton Labs in Didcot. Um, here, data from the CERN colliders, um, the, uh, the four or five colliders um, that collect data, and that is then distributed uh, via a hierarchy of data centers. Um, and the first level of that hierarchy is the tier one, as the set of data, uh, tier one data centers, there are 13 of those in, in a, uh, in a in 13 different countries around the planet. And when we first, at a very high level, the energy consumption of the tier one site and this, of all other data centers can be described by the energy consumption of the servers um, and the networking equipment within the data center. That's the IT power um, plotted here on the right hand side over the last two years. And um, in addition, overheads from cooling and other infrastructure services arise, and this is normally expressed as a coefficient called the power, power usage effectiveness, PUE. Um, here, we see that here on the left. And um, with those two numbers, we were able to, or everyone is, is able to calculate the scope two emissions. Um, uh, and, and for 2021, those were about 13 gigawatt hours um, of electricity uh, in, uh, for, for the RAL data center and using an average carbon intensity for the UK for that year, we can calculate the carbon impact to be about 3,000 tons of CO2. Uh, three, three, yeah, 3,000 tons, three kilotons. And um, whether this is uh, a lot or not um, really depends on on, on context. Um, uh, it is important to understand that the carb the energy consumption of the CERN facilities, um, including the colliders and data centers in Geneva, um, were about 1.3 terawatt hours. Um, however, um, this is uh, the data center in RAL is only one of of 13 tier one, and then there's a, a set of tier two data centers as well. But this uh, allows us to get some perspective. Now, one so the next the question we we have is uh, we want to understand decarbonization options, and we see when we look at those graphs that the energy consumption is very flat, or the power draw of that um, um, of the machinery is very flat. It doesn't vary. Uh, doesn't vary very much. And and this is um, the, the result of STFC running. Uh, the infrastructure at capacity. They get a lot of compute out of this, um, but it also means that um, there aren't uh, inefficiencies as such um, that are an obvious uh, target uh, to exploit, uh, to eliminate waste. Um, but we do know that the carbon intensity of the electricity varies a lot. And uh, and much of what um, what I'll talk about later on is is exactly around that how the data center can be um, become a more active participant in the electric grid and and we'll, we'll analyze this in the context of of the of the RAL side but uh, some of those findings will be transferable to other data centers as well. Um, before we do this, we want to understand the power consumption of the workload and and we want to understand. Um, the variability really of the grid carbon intensity. I'll speak quickly to that. Um, the the most common way to understand carbon emissions of the electric grid of the electric grid is with an average number describing um, the, uh, the 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 net uh, carbon uh, imp, uh, emissions um, from all of the various sources that generate electricity and feed it into the uh, UK grid overall, including imports. Um, and, and it's reported annually, and, um, and DEFRA, um, or, or the UK government from DEFRA, uh, provides those numbers for everyone to use for company reporting. This is the, the most common way that uh, people think about the carbon intensity of electricity. However, it varies over the, uh, over the course of the, um, over the, over the country. Um, so that that that's why there's a location uh, specific carbon intensity that can be described in average, 
and it also varies um, uh, over the course of the day um, as different um, as renew as the, the 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 contribution of renewables varies as the demand for electricity varies over the course of the day. And with this, we get this uh, more dynamic perspective um, that is described by the marginal energy consumption, um, in, uh, which is which which could be understood as what is the electricity uh, carbon intensity for the next kilowatt hour that is consumed um, from the from the grid. And one of of course it's possible to combine this uh, this uh, temporal marginal perspective also with a spatial marginal perspective. And here is a. Uh, um, an illustration of a model that was created for for the, uh, the German electricity grid, um, and um, one of the outcomes of this project um, was the creation of of such a model for the UK, um, and I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, but before I get to that, um, I wanted to talk about um, a small scale measurement study that we carried out. And I'm wondering if Noah is interested uh, to talk us through this, uh, because I know you're in the audience. Otherwise, I'll, I'll just continue speaking. Um, you can continue speaking. <laughs> OK, all right. So what we had here um, was uh, what, what we see here are graphs collected uh, describing the power consumption of containerized workload. Um, in this specific case, it's um, it's it's one of the uh, containers uh, from the that, that processes data from the Atlas Collider, yeah, one of those colliders in CERN, and um, and one of the most striking features um, that we that we can see in the first uh, uh, in, in the two top row graphs um, of power consumption is the um, is the the high uh, level of um, uh, of it's a, it's a static power consumption. It varies very little. Um, that's that, that this is um, the reason why in aggregate the power consumption of the of the whole data center is also so extremely uh, uh, consistent and, 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 and static. Um, what we what was uh, what, what what then uh, Noah and uh, and his team her team in in Oxford um, have have analyzed is how can a combination of um, of of containers um, uh, via uh, placement and scheduling um, affect the overall energy consumption um, from from a set of containers um, uh, full stop how can how can the, the placement decisions um uh, affect the, the energy consumption for this workload and um and what they saw in the experimental setup um and they looked at intel architectures as well as amd architectures is that the power consumption is not negligible of this um of of the servers um if i remember correctly um and this is this this also applies to the uh, to the RAL service, where there's this uh, sort of a baseline power consumption of, of uh, about 40 to 50 percent, um, and um, and when it comes to to those containers and how they utilize the cores, um, then more cores result in higher energy efficiency and higher throughput, and sharing cores via multi-threading increases the energy efficiency per job but lowers the throughput. So these are um, these are some preliminary findings um, that. That, that can affect uh, the scheduling in, in RAL. Um, moving on from this, um, I'm returning now to the findings um, of the, of the uh, analysis of the electricity uh, carbon intensity that was carried out in Newcastle, uh, because um, now that we see there's very little um, of variation in the, in the power consumption, the question is, what can we do um, to decarbonize? And, what we find is that there's an enormous variability in the marginal locational carbon intensity. And what we see here are four example um, uh, days, um, uh, and, and they show how the marginal carbon intensity varies relative to the grid carbon intensity. So this is this is the, the main um the main sort of attack front to 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 uh, uh, evaluate uh, decarbonization um, ideas um, within this project. Now, in order to provide a quantitative 
support for, for, for these analyses, we are in the process of constructing a system dynamics model. Um, this allows us to evaluate trends over time. So looking at 2030, 2050, um, and, and see how decarbonization of the electricity grid um, here and elsewhere in the world um, as a background trend, uh, together with uh, concrete initiatives within the UK and within the data center, all come together to result in the potential for decarbonization. Um, and, and here's an example. We could, for example, increase um, the, the capacity, create some spare capacity, and then see um, if, 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 if we can uh, reduce work during uh, periods when the carbon intensity is very high, um, and so result in a net reduction of carbon intensity, even though if we keep even uh, while we keep the overall workload the same. But of course, we need to balance um, the, the, uh, the embodied impact as well. So going forward, um, we we are looking forward to further develop this uh, carbon intensity model for the um, locational um, uh, marginal carbon emissions. We are in the process of evaluating the scope three emissions for the embodied, so the hardware impact from manufacturing. And, and then we are um, we're looking for developing methodologies and incentives um, for energy efficient job deployments based on the work that we've seen that comes from Oxford and then look at systemic um, or system level optimizations um, that, that reduce um, carbon intensity um, while um, uh, and, and, and improve energy efficiency at the same time. That's it. Thank you very much for your attention. Now, um, if anyone's got any check questions, return to tap anything from the slides. Um, sorry, I'm just keeping an eye out on all the other places. Ag, you've got your hand up. My Zoom screen's gone everywhere, so apologies that I'm not looking um, directly at the camera. Ag, did thank you, you Daniel. Yeah. Yeah. Thank. Thank you. It looks really interesting, and and I'm, I'm interested in seeing how how applicable your systems dy dynamics model might be. One question is the um, the inclusion in that model of the embodied carbon. Um, how how um, generalized do you think that part of the model can be? Or does it need a lot of input from, you know, every, every different vendor, manufacturer, et cetera? So I would say that um, the, the uncertainty there's 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 uh, there's there will always be uncertainty in such a model but i believe that we are able to represent um important um types of machinery and their embodied impact um and so identify first order of magnitude relevance of each of those factors yeah, and if and we can and and we can represent uncertainty within each of the parameters as well, and then carry out sensitivity analysis to understand if variability in any particular uh, uh, in any particular component affects the overall result. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, Fergus has got his hand up, so I'm going to. I guess let you answer the question and then my my alarm's about to go off to say that we've run out of time. I don't know if you heard that. So if you ask your question and then we'll go on to our next speaker before we've got sure. I'll, Thanks, Sophie. I'll try to keep it um, sharp. I mean, just maybe a question, a question here, Daniel. A lot of that sort of, and again, I'm not an expert here, so forgive me if I, but a lot of that sort of focused on the hardware aspects yet. I'm just wondering, I mean, at the end, um, if I remember correctly, part of the aim was really to demonstrate a service level quantification of carbon footprints, right? And I think there was a service that you had chosen. I cannot exactly remember which one. Um, yeah. Were you able to demonstrate that? Have I just misunderstood the presentation? So, yes. Yeah, so, so, uh, so thanks for the question. I think what we, we carried out a pivot from seeing how static the power draw of those containers were the analysis of the carbon footprint for that specific service became trivial mm -hmm. okay. and so we thought what can we what uh, what can we do differently to provide um to provide uh value with the with the resource we had yeah that that was the that that was the, that was that what that's what happened right right okay that makes sense fair enough 
is that something new? Maybe just a final question. Is that a surprise? It was surprising how high the utilization of the overall data center was. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Thanks. All right. Thanks, Dan. There's some there's some comments in the chat, so I shall leave you to look at those um, uh, during the next talk. Thank you very much. I think we've got Jonathan Hayes next with Iriscast. Dan, if you could stop sharing oh, your screen oh, as well, that would be great. Of course. Uh, let me try and get this working. And I'll try to find out how... Have I not stopped yet? Have um, I not... I've stopped you now, Dan, Fantastic. that's fine. So, John, you should I'm just clicking Good buttons, old Zoom, trying right? to uh, arrange all these windows on my screen so I can share the no slideshow. Problem. There we go. Share. Let me know when you can see that. We can see it. Thank you. Excellent. Right. I, I have a suspicion here that I have too many slides for the 10 minutes, so I'm gonna, I may skip a few as I go along, but many, many thanks for Daniel covering some similar ground because there are there are um, significant synergies in, in in what we're doing. So it may be that I can get away with that without leaving anybody too far uh, behind. Right. Oops. So uh, Iriscast is one of the projects that came out of the 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 sandpit, and the basic principle behind it was that if you want to make good robust decisions, you need good robust information, and that fundamentally what we need to do is go out and try and do it and work out what the challenges and the barriers are um so the the sort of questions that we were trying to look at were could we estimate the carbon costs across a broad heterogeneous infrastructure and look at what the particular challenges are when you have lots of different type of kit run in different ways with different instrumentation and what would the, the the barriers to being able to scale up to that that kind of thing can we identify any of the key drivers um and think also about once we've got that information how what might we communicate it to drive drive change so the sort of actions and objectives that come out of that are bringing people together across different facilities um with different tooling different remits different whatever and see if we can work together i think we've proven that we can learn by doing really rather than sit down and doing a paper exercise as to what whatever let's just get on with it and see what the challenges are uh document that as we go along so that we can pull together the requirements for future work and decision making and then find ways to communicate that outwards um so this was funded more or less for six months under the ukraine at zero scoping project here's here's the team that we we put together so not what one of the things here that we should acknowledge is many of these people are not funded by the project, but rather a drawing from the communities within the IRIS project, which I uh, I can say more about in questions if you want to know, um, but I want to focus on the IRIS cast bit of that uh, today. Uh, and you can see this is across multiple institutes from the full, the full breadth of the country. Um, so we started out hoping to be able to get three facilities, but in the end, we were able to get six. And these were two tier two sites um, from GridPP. So it's sort of analogous to the tier one site we were just talking about, but smaller and based out in different areas around the country at a, a tier two level um, at Queen Mary and Imperial. Then we uh, were able to get data from the um, STFC Scientific Computing Division cloud. Uh, running at RAL and the SCARF facility also at RAL. We also got contributions from the direct collaboration from some of their clusters at Durham and also some from information from Cambridge on some of the equipment that they run on behalf of IRIS um, at Cambridge. And it, the, the project sort of came in four parts. First of all, we really did want to understand uh, if we could the embodied carbon in the system and what we were dealing with. So that really means you need a good inventory of what you've got there. Um, the idea of the project was to connect, collect a snapshot of data over a 24 hour period. So we need to plan and then collect all the data, do some analysis and then try and communicate the results out there. So the inventory we did pretty early on, 
Um, here we were defining the scope of the audit, built a comprehensive list of all the equipment that was within scope, uh, down to the different models of different bits of equipment. It's quite a detailed audit, um, which went into, uh, at some level, our, our approach to modeling the carbon. Um, as I already said, the data collection uh, happened over a period of 24 hours. We actually did more than one run of this. There were some technical problems at one of the sites, and then we learned some uh, some lessons from that first run to collect a bit more data. And in some cases, some of the facilities decided just to continuously collect data prompted by this project, and will continue to do so for the foreseeable future. So that was quite a nice little side benefit there. And the idea was that we would log information at a sort of rack level, so collections of bits of equipment sitting in a machine room at the individual node level. So this is the individual box sitting in a rack. Um, and then where, where possible, the job level. So where you have individual workloads, can we log any information about those workloads and build that into there? And then put it all together into a central repository for sharing and further analysis. Now, the idea of the analysis was then to curate all those data sets to try and bring them into a coherent picture, taking into account the different ways of, of instrumenting kit, the different ways of, of uh, measuring these things and build up a coherent picture, refine the carbon model and then extract insights, observations and conclusions. And you'll see on there, I put done brackets almost. Uh, we, we are running a little behind with this on, on the analysis, but we have uh, quite a, a, a beefy report in uh in in preparation i'm not sure how many pages no, it's, it's probably about 24. oh we're down to 24 we've done a lot of editing down but it's 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 still a little bit long but we're we're still finalizing some of those things um in terms of the community engagement as part of the ukri net zero session at cr uk we gave a talk um we're in the process of, of producing that report uh, we have a curated data set, but it's not quite ready for publishing. We haven't quite figured out the best way to get it out there, uh, but we will. Um, we had a workshop in Cambridge in January, and we also had a presentation of this and really good discussion at the IRIS collaboration meeting on the 13th of January. Uh, so that's that's the status. Now I just wanted to go over some of the little bits of work that contributed to, to the project. So one of the, uh, the things that uh, was carried out by our colleagues at uh, Rutherford Lab, um, Anish and Alison, um, was to collect all this data, do some cleaning and tidying of it, and then build it into an open search based uh, uh, platform um, to provide visualizations, dashboards. It also provides an API to extract uh, the data. And they put that together with all the data from the different, the six different sites. Here's a snapshot of one of those dashboards. So you can see it just pulls together lots of interesting bits of information. There are also various visualizations it can do. Um, we were also trying to look at comparing different sources of information. So there you 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 may have a power distribution unit that's delivering power to a collection of nodes in your data center. And many of those are instrumented so you can work out what the power going in is, but also your nodes individually can give you the power. And so you can cross check those two and see if there are any uh, discrepancies. And so we're, we're looking into that. We don't have any, uh, I would say solid results on that, but uh, depending on what platform you're looking at and which model of PDU, you can see consistent results to within a couple of percent or with some other ways of looking at it with other devices, you end up with 20% differences. And we're still trying to understand whether this is a difference in the definition of what is being measured, or if there are uh, calibration issues for, for different devices. So whether the, um, uh, the, the information is completely reliable there is, is something we need to investigate a little bit more. Um, just to show some some plots of energy usage um, across just a couple of the facilities as a as a sort of an example. So this shows um, in red the CPU usage across the tier two farm at Queen Mary during the period of the snapshot, and you can see the uh, the usage is varying between about forty percent and sixty percent um on on the facility at that time and then the blue line shows the energy usage and you can see there is some correlation between the two 
um, but there's obviously a uh, uh, not quite a linear relationship between the CPU usage and the energy usage on there. And again, the analysis of that is is still ongoing, um, but we we know the 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 completely idle usage of a node is not not zero. So it's it's not unexpected that you'd see something like that. So the power usage is is fairly flat, and that just represents that the the cluster um, generally is pretty full um, over over that period of time. And here's a similar plot from from Cambridge showing a slightly lower CPU usage, um, but again it tracks well with the energy usage and is fairly flat over time. One of the things we were trying to get out of this, but haven't quite figured out. Uh, really whether we can or if there's more data that would need to be required that we would put into our, our gap analysis is is quite what the cause of the uh, CPU efficiency is. Are these nodes that are uh, completely full but uh, uh, bottlenecked on input output and that kind of thing or are they underutilized and that has different implications um, when it comes to decision making about uh, procurement. Um, so then thinking about the carbon model, obviously the energy data, we need to turn it into an estimate of carbon. Um, and so this is a piece of work mainly done by Adrian Jackson at, at, at Edinburgh. Um, and so here we, we don't have a very precise model. So there are a lot of assumptions going in here. So do take any numbers with a rather large pinch of salt, but it is indicative of, of what we could do um, and with a more refined model. So thinking about the embodied carbon, this really varies considerably depending on the node configuration. We dragged down um, some example data sheets for two uh, representative pieces of equipment. The one on the left um, shows a, a, a particular compute server from Dell, and the one on the right shows one from Fujitsu, and they have rather different um, fractions of the carbon footprint coming from the embodied carbon, which is rather small for the Dell. I'm not quite sure if it's about um, uh, 10 to 20% on the left, and it's more like 40 to 50% for the Fujitsu equipment. And so really it depends quite what's in the box. Some components, uh, notably uh, uh, silicon, uh, really high energy costs in their production and correspondingly large uh, carbon footprints. So um, there's there's a there's missing information there that that needs to be tracked down if you want to get an accurate number. So we what we did rather than just throw our hands in the air and say, well, we don't have accurate numbers, is try and build up a, a, a number of scenarios just so we can give some 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 answers. So if we take a just a, a single node and get an approximate value, so this would be a relatively uh, low carbon thing and you assume a four year lifespan, uh, the, the embodied carbon there works out about 0.24 kilograms CO2 equivalent per day. Um, that would be what, uh, the, the lower end. Um, so if you take the resources that we used in the snapshot taken from our inventory, there's about 2,398 compute notes there. So that works out about 575.25 kilograms CO2 equivalent. Um, but like I say, big pinches of salt, we don't have the information from the manufacturers on the exact equipment to be able to be uh, precise about that. Now you can take that and build up a bunch of scenarios where you say, well, um, let's say we have a, a, a low, a medium and a high, and then we can combine that with the power information that we've got on the active carbon. And again, we're still working through these checking, but these, these are the, uh, the results so far that will be in our, our, our final report. Um, and here again, we looked at the available data on the carbon intensity of the grid at the time of the snapshot. And so we have that and we could build a number for that. But what we decided to do again was build a low, medium and a high model that represents um, uh, a different carbon intensity. So they're, they're on the bottom left there. The low scenario was 50 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour, then 175 for the medium and 300 for the high. And that pretty much spans the variability during uh, the period of the snapshot. And so we can then take that, look at the power information from each of the, uh, the sites and work out, well, what would their uh, energy or their carbon usage, sorry, be 
for a low, medium or high scenario, and that's in the table on the right. And then a really simple analysis is just to divide that by node, but given the variability on the nodes, again, don't, don't worry too much about that number, but that's basically just taking the number on the left and dividing by the number of compute nodes. Really, we need something a little bit more intelligent um, for, for that. And so we'll have something slightly different in the report. John, you're nearly at time. You've maybe got about 30 seconds a minute left, I'm afraid. Okay, well, I'm nearly there. I have, well, let me let me let me jump to the to the bottom line then. So here's the, the carbon footprint we 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 put together assuming um various different assumptions, low, medium, high for the embodied carbon for the uh active usage. We also looked at the impact of varying PUE, which Daniel talked about in his presentation between 1.1 at the low end and 1.6 at the high end to put together these various different scenarios, also taking into account uh, different assumptions on how long you run the kit for before you uh, recycle it. Oh. Um, so the, the summary of that is the active carbon is between 1,000 and 9,000 kilograms of CO2 for the snapshot period um, compared with an embodied carbon estimate of about uh, 500 or so. So the active looks bigger at the moment, but it that really varies on these assumptions. So it will be important to nail down those assumptions if we want uh, a, a more refined model. So some of the, the conclusions we've got, um, we do, we are able to make power measurements at all of the sites because this is something that is standard. Um, they may not be well calibrated and there's some issues about differing ways of doing that. Um, when it comes to getting more detailed information at the job level, we were only able to do this at two of the sites, and there the, the calculations are not well understood, um, but that may be a mechanism to dig into that. So we will be developing a series of recommendations uh, around that, about how sites might want to be configured to provide that. In terms of the gaps there, we don't have good facility PUE data. We had excellent information from EPCC, um, on, on their stuff, but they weren't included in the snapshot. Um, but that, that gave us some, some interesting information. Um, the, we did look at the building embedded costs, but they look relatively small actually compared to the, to the usage. Um, we don't have a good measure of the baseline idle power draw. Um, we were hoping that the, the variation in usage would be a bit higher, but actually it was fairly flat across the period. And a lot of the equipment that we've got, we weren't able to find good estimates so far of the embodied carbon. So that's that's something that's needed. Um, in terms of initial recommendations, we think that reporting on this will be very important in the future as, as we're able to put things together more accurately. Um, probably we don't want minute by minute reporting, but some kind of monthly reporting, possibly on a dashboard would be really good. But this will require some kind of standardization or harmonization across sites that are involved in it to make sure that we're we're comparing like with like and adding things together that make sense. Um, and we do need to make sure that all the equipment there is capable of producing the information. One thing we discovered is that it's better to measure the energy rather than the power. Um, this is a bit of a more robust measure. If you get gaps in the data, it doesn't matter. You can you can fill them in. And one final thing is that obviously we'll see in presentations today, I think several areas of overlap where it would be good for us to come together and combine information and intelligence on that. Okay, that's it, thank you. Brilliant. Thanks, John. Um, let me just see if we've got any hands raised, if you've got a question for John Martin, has got your got a hand up. Yeah, but, um, thanks, John. We've probably got time for about one question, just to, just to clarify. Okay, so yeah, thanks, John, very nice. I just want to ask if your, <clears throat> sorry, your dashboard, is that something that would be easy to extend to other servers? Is it something with a kind of reporting API that could be expanded? I think the 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 dashboard we were using probably not because the um, that that dashboard is really you dump the data in there and it, it provides ways to visualize it. I think what we would like to see is a reporting dashboard created. Um, I certainly, with my sort of 
Iris Science Director hat on, would like to see something like that eventually for Iris, so that we have a way to uh, to to monitor that. Um, that would then be something where it's probably adaptable to other communities. And um, we would learn from doing that whether it's perhaps completely worthwhile for everybody else to do something similar, or do we learn nothing from it other than, you know, if everything's flat the entire time, then probably you don't learn anything from your monthly monitoring. But if you can cross reference it with uh, server occupancy, and other usage stats on a bigger scale than we were able to do with the snapshot, um, there might be important information in there. But we're still sort of teasing out what the metrics should be, but hopefully we'll be able to put something in the report. Right, that, that might change on a year by year basis as if you have different um, echelons of kit coming in for the more carbon yeah. efficient. So having it there might be flat to begin with, but it might then staircase down. Yeah, thanks. That's good. Right. Okay. Thank you. If anyone else has got any more questions that you want to ask John, add them in the chat or we can discuss them at the end. And Michael's already got his screen ready to present. He knew that I was going to say that you're up next. Um, you are muted though, Michael. Cool. I will have to do this fairly quick because I have to disappear just after no three o'clock. Um, and hopefully our pitch does at the right level. It is fairly high level, but we're very happy to take questions. So we are the Energy Aware Heterogeneous Computing at Scale Project, or Energetic, less of a mouthful. I'm Michael Bain. I'm a Manchester Metropolitan, and the work was done with Oliver Edinburgh, DPN, and Tamor Newcastle, Jamie and David at UCL. And in the bottom right-hand corner, you can see a QR to our it's quite a basic website, but I believe we've already uploaded our report there if people want to see more. So what was the project about? We had two high-level aims to see if we could work out how and when the use of accelerators, by which we specifically mean GPUs and FPGAs, how they could be used to reduce the energy of solution of various scientific codes compared to just running on the kind of box standard CPU. And we also kind of related to this, wanted to understand whether there was a, and what the, um, the, the, the people's requests were for a kind of standardized portable way of measuring energy. And we wanted to see if, you know, by use of these heterogeneous platforms, we could actually save energy compared to just using CPU. So it's quite a short project like all the others you're going to hear about, only seven and a half months. And we, we completed much of it and handed in a report the other week. So how did we do this? Um, we did a bit review of software-based measurement techniques, looking at things like PAPI and RAPL. And we also employed some of these and did some direct measurements. And I'll show you a picture of one of the kits that Newcastle will use shortly. And we also had a workshop as part of Computing Insight UK, where we had about 25 people all talking about uh, how they uh, are struggling, really, to gain measurements of energy consumed, whether they're running on CPUs, GPUs, FPGAs, et cetera. And then in terms of the actual measuring energy to see if we could save energy by using accelerators, we had to get some kind of prototypical computational benchmarks. And these ended up being primarily based on the Birchley dwarfs. And given the very short time scale of the project, we didn't have time to port any uh, algorithm to either a CP, sorry, to either a GPU or an FPGA. And for those who are not aware of FPGAs, they're reconfigurable and they've, uh, they've got a data flow model and it takes a lot more effort to optimize efficiently for an FPGA. So we want to use what was already out there, but then we were also reliant on what was already out there. And I'll come back to that in the conclusions. So then we have to decide where we're going to run these. And we took two uh, scenarios, an HPC scenario, and we use machines at the Edinburgh Parallel Computing Centre and also at UCL. And we had a workstation, which many researchers would also have access to. 
based at Newcastle. And each of these had a CPU, a GPU, and an FPGA, or more than one of these. This is the details. Um, I won't go into great detail there, but if people want to know more about any of the architecture, let us know. And then we have to work out how we're actually going to measure energy on each of these. So on the Intel chips, we can use RAPL, and this gives us the energy since some previous time. So we measure it, measure the value of the RAPL counter, do our benchmark, look at the RAPL counter again, and the difference will give us the energy. And that's quite straightforward. And as Jonathan said, if you're going to measure power, you've got to make sure you kind of do this over time and then integrate instantaneous power measurements over time. And unfortunately, on the GPU and the FPGA platforms, that's the approach we had to take. So for GPUs, we use NVIDIA's SMI interface, instantaneous power, wrapped our benchmark in the script, polled power every millisecond or something, and then integrated over time to get the energy. And for the Xilinx FPGAs, we use their utility XP util in a similar manner. So this gives us the energy for each of the different components. We also, or Newcastle also, had a direct measurement approach, used something like the picture above. So they could see how much current was flowing and knew the voltage, and we could work out the instantaneous power and again integrate that. And we used this to show that the measurements were consistent, not as we've seen before, 100% the same. But what we're interested in these set of experiments is can we save energy? So it's the relative savings rather than absolute values that mattered. So this gave us confidence in our approach using RAPL, NVIDIA, SMI, and XB Util was good. Here's some results. So I will try and explain the first one, and then there's a few more that I'll quickly go through. So these are all relative to the host CPU. So values less than one mean that we use less energy on the accelerator, and that would be good. You can see there's a solid bar with a bit of a non-solid bar above it for the GPUs and FPGAs. And the non-solid part of that histogram is the energy being consumed by the CPU host. So whilst we're using a GPU, the CPU is still there consuming some energy. So it's only fair to include that in the calculations. And you can see that for the larger size, so this is a matrix matrix problem, very compute bound. We did it for two sizes, 4,096 and 16,000. And you can see that we did find some energy improvements, energy speeds up in terms of using different accelerators, particularly for the larger data set. When we look at FFT, uh, Fourier transforms is used in many scientific models. We can I have to move my thing out of the way. We can also see, for example, FPGAs are using much less energy than the CPUs. And for the larger case, the GPU is also using less, but for the smaller case, we can see, and we don't understand this fully, that the CPU host was using so much energy during the time of the kernel running on the GPU that it actually um, was less energy efficient than just using the CPU by itself. So we need to go back and look at that one, time permitting. Then we looked at more compute bound, uh, sorry, communications bound. So this is about data flowing in and out. And again, you can see the numbers are less than one for both types of accelerators. And then we had a quick look at neural networks. Um, this is a bit more complicated, but you can see that generally that the uh, accelerators were using less apart from the ResNet 50. So now we're seeing that the kind of the type of algorithm you use might affect the results. And if we take all that and replot, in this case, what we've got is for each algorithm, which is the best case scenario that we've seen across all the different implementations. So we can see in the matrix matrix that in, we're looking at the brown ones really. I mean, time is interesting, but energy is what we're talking about in this project. Um, we can see for matrix matrix, we can go 
two and a quarter, 2.3 times better energy efficiency by using the GPU. So the GPU was better than the FPGA in terms of energy efficiency to solution in this case. FFT, we can get up to nearly 18 times more efficient by using an FPGA stream, the kind of memory bound one, 1 1.2, so not quite as good. And then we also had access to some embedded FPGAs. So these are, are much smaller cards and they were doing very well on the convolutional neural nets as well. So across the board, the accelerators were doing better than the CPUs. We did find there's no single portable interface for measuring energy. As I mentioned earlier, we had to use a bit of RAPL, a bit of NVIDIA SMI, and a bit of XBUtil. But we did find from the workshop that everyone wants this. So that's something that we think more work should be done on. We found that FPGA performance is very sensitive to the, the quality of the port, and we were relying on what people gave. Uh, so we feel there is more to come in terms of improved energy by use of FPGAs. When you're using an accelerator on the PCI Express, you, you still have a host CPU. And we didn't do anything about trying to make better use of that CPU whilst we're running the benchmark on the accelerator. We could have off not offloaded all of it and made better use of the CPU, but there wasn't enough time and effort in this project. But overall, we're saying that generally accelerators can give improved energy to solution compared to CPUs. And in future, we think more detailed analysis is required, further benchmarks and more work on tuning the FPGA ports because we don't feel we've got optimal ports there. And we also want to look at a fully heterogeneous implementation where it's not just using either the FPGA or the CPU, but is, is using all of the C it's using all aspects of CPU and GPU and FPGA all within the same implementation. And then the recommendations that we put in the report are UKRI invests in accelerators, more work to see which is best and when, the uh, DRI system administrators uh, work together to find a way to expose energy data to users, and that UKRI starts to move towards requiring this kind of information in people's reports, et cetera. But that would also require raising awareness of how to do energy uh, consumption savings. And we think there should be something like green software engineers to help train the community and support the community in reducing energy to solution. Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Michael. Um, I am aware that you said you needed to leave at three and we are now at one minute past. I, I can three, take so one question. I can take a question. Take one question if there's yeah. any questions. Um, I can't see any hands up at the moment. I'm just sharing the chat. I can't see any. Oh, John's put his hand I'll, up. I'll, I'll ask one question if, if nobody else has got one, which is what to what, to what extent is the availability of codes that can run on accelerators a bottleneck because I didn't I didn't see that in the the recommendations, but certainly in our communities that's been a problem. Good point. It's kind of I guess a bit implicit that we were relying particularly for FPGAs for the ports that were available, and there was they were the the choice they already ported once was quite restrictive. However, for GPUs there is a wide range of different applications already ported to GPUs. There is also numerical libraries available for both. So depending on the, the granularity of your problem, you might be able to kind of just make use of various numerical libraries on FPGAs or GPUs. Overall, it needs more work and more investment, but we feel that we, we kind of came out showing the hypothesis was true, that there is energy savings to be made. So if we want to get to net zero, we need to invest time and energy in time and effort into porting to the most efficient hardware. Right. Thank you. Um, I have completely forgotten. Who's next? Who's next? Andy and Alistair. Andy, you're raring to go with your screen share. Thank you. I can't hear you though, Andy. I think you're muted.
Right, sorry. The you? button wouldn't, okay. the, the only, once you were muted me, it was fine. But when the button, <laughs> no I tried problem. to use the button, it wouldn't let me. <laughs> sorry about that. Um, so, uh, so I'm going to tell the HPC Jeep. Um, Alistair's going to do some talking as well later on. Um, we're going to transfer over in a minute, but I'll, I'll start off and Alistair will still finish. Um, the idea between, behind the um, HPC Jeep um, project or small project here was to have a look at uh, what we've got on HPC systems in terms of understanding per job energy data. So, so you know, these are the individual jobs that run on, system, on the systems. We've seen a bit about system um, energy utilization in the previous presentations, but this was trying to look at can we attribute energy use to particular um, jobs on the system? And then can we use that data um, to gain any sort of understanding of how people use the system and maybe advise people on the way towards um, net zero goals or, uh, and being more efficient? Um, Secondly, we look at if we could use this energy data to introduce energy-based charging mechanisms on HPC systems. Uh, currently, HPC systems are generally charged on uh, residency, so how many node hours or core hours or GPU hours or something like that you can use. And you know, can we use the data we have available at the moment to introduce some energy-based charging um, to try and help users have some levers to pull to um, be more energy efficient um, in their use of HPC systems? And, and, and the third goal was really to propose some sort of energy and potentially emissions metrics that can be provided back to HPC service stakeholders. By that, I mean everybody, right? So users to understand their utilization, service, service operators to understand the overall system picture and, and to funders um, to understand how things are changing over time and, and uh, to try and help them make decisions around procurement maybe and, and planning future systems um, further down the line. Of these three goals, uh, we've released the report for uh, the first one. It's uh, available on Zenodo. The link's also on the um, the the, uh, the UKRI DRI scoping project website as well. Um, the second one is very close um, to being released and hopefully should be out in the next couple of weeks or so. Um, and the third one following shortly after that as well. Um, what we'll we do is put the recommendations at the start because we're time constrained here. So we'll, we'll do this and see how far we get with the rest of, rest of our slides. I mean, essentially, we have two, two sort of separate things here, one around procurement and one around operation. Um, and what, what the first one's understanding your operating environment. You know, are you operating on fully renewable energy? Because as we've seen from the Iris Castio, you know, those sorts of things um, change the balance between um, where the carbon comes from in terms of embodied carbon or in terms of um, emissions from the energy generated to run the, run the service and, and would change the decision about how long you operate the service for and what type of components you buy and, and, and decisions like that. Um, the embodied emissions, uh, which was hot, is data that's hard to get hold of, as Ariscast found as well, you know, should be part of the bid responses um, that provided by vendors and getting vendors to provide consistent um, uh, data in this area you know, is one thing that we can maybe push for here. Um, Per job energy data collection should be a mandatory functionality as part of the system operation. Um, so you can actually collect the data and understand what's going on in your system. Um, and energy efficiency, typically when you're on procurement benchmarks, you look at um, the performance you can get out of them to try and get the best value for money. Um, but really we should be looking at energy efficiency here as well to get the best um, energy efficiency as well. And the storage of fabric should be specified in a way that minimizes end use while not impacting performance. So that's typically don't over specify, right? Because any stuff, as we've seen, that you're not utilizing because it's idle and so it can still have a large component um, of, of energy. So any over provision actually reduces your um, efficiency in terms of energy on the system. Um, and in terms of operation, we need to report to the users and use, put it in context form so they can understand it. Luckily, most users are better able to understand energy use context now um, after the energy and uh, high energy prices everybody's been looking at their bills and understanding kilowatt hours so people are better positioned to understand what's going on there um, and do the analysis um, of your energy use profile which we've been looking at uh, in this project we'll show some data in a moment um, enable some mechanisms that either reward use for energy or emissions efficient use give them some levers they can pull to do things because most people actually do want to do their bit and want to be efficient and explore possibilities for energy emissions where job scheduling and that we didn't have time really to do that as part of this project it wasn't part of the whole the, the aims um, but from the data we've got in this project we think that this may be something that could be looked at in the future um, the other thing we wanted to point out is uh, i mean i've followed discussions with various people including adrian jackson who's who's been mentioned before already on this call you know, there is a difference between um 
energy or power efficiency versus emissions efficiency. And typically, I mean, and we were guilty of this at the start of the project as we gained, uh, before we gained more understanding, you know, people's focus on the energy use of DRI with respect to net zero goals, but generally embodied emissions are much more critical for DRI, particularly around, uh, particularly in the HPC systems we were looking at. So if you have an HPC service of by 100% renewable energy contract, um, which uh, Archer 2, for example, is, most of the emissions are embodied and the most emissions efficient approach really is to get the maximum research output over its lifetime, run as high performance as possible, irrespective of the energy efficiency. But there are all the drivers for being more energy or power efficient, reducing load on the grid and the reducing the requirement for high carbon peak demand. So starting up coal fired fire station, power stations or gas fired power stations when demand goes high, if you can make yourself uh, more energy or power efficient, then you can reduce the requirement to do that. You can free up re renewable energy capacity for other users because um, providers can only a certain sell how much renewable energy capacity they have. And if you're using less of it, that frees up more of it to be sold. I um, mean, it reduces the cooling overheads, which further improves the energy efficiency. That's the PUE you heard about in earlier uh, presentations. But making a system more energy efficient may reduce its emissions efficiency in terms of it, because the calculations are running slower, have better output per watt or kilowatt hour, but worse output of equivalent grams of CO2 um, of the embodied emissions because you're not getting as much out of um, the embodied emissions over the lifetimes of the service. And you know, as DRI is moving on to low emissions energy, the UK national grid is going to decarbonize. And so focus on the energy use actually is probably less useful, um, we think, for a long-term net zero goals, uh, whereas a focus on embodied carbon is probably more, more interesting in terms of large, large HPC systems we were looking at anyway. Um, so I'm just going to skip quickly through a few slides. What one thing we did was at least for in the first instance have a look about um, where the power went on these large HPC systems on Archer 2 and the Cosmos system in, in, in Durham. Um, and you see most of it goes on the compute nodes and running the running the uh, the high um, high power uh, calculations with a small amount on interconnect storage and cooling. Um, there's some sort of coincidence that for Archer 2 and Cosmo, the compute node um, power power drop percentages were very high, even though the systems are quite different in characteristic. Uh, we think that's just um, lucky. Um, and the, these, this breakdown only includes the sort of in-cabinet components. So cooling's cabinet CDU, it doesn't include the plant and, and the data center to, that required to run these HPC systems. Um, we were able to also look at different, uh, for, particularly from the Archer 2 data, break down by different research areas and different um, software. Um, and different, uh, and look at the power power use power draw distributions. Um, I'm not going to go into into real detail on this. The report's up there, and I'm happy to take questions um, at the end of this presentation. But you know, it, it's only a short presentation. We don't really have time. I just wanted to give you a flavour that we've been able to break it down by both research area and software. Um, and we've also looked at energy based charging on Archer Two, and the report's uh, just about to come out on this one. And we are, we're basically proposing a charging for job charging based on, on and allocations based on um, a, co a combination of residency and energy-based charging. This is similar to your household electricity bill. We have, um, have um, a standing charge for providing the resources um, and a use charge. And the same is true of um, HPC systems. There's a standing charge, the cost that was required to procure the system and the operational cost of, of running it. Um, I've got some more details there. I'm sure that the slides can be shared afterwards. But I want to give Alistair a chance to talk as well. So I'm going to hand over to Alistair now and just be his remote control from now on. He'll talk a bit more about the work um, that he's been doing around embodied CO2 and, um, and, and emissions reporting on Cosma. So yeah, Alistair, yeah. brilliant. Thanks. So uh, one thing we did was we looked at some of the information that was available from Dell uh, based on some of the servers that we have for Cosma. And... Um, we were able to find out that you know one of these servers, for example, has a 1.2 tons of embodied CO2. Now, of course, this is data that I think very quickly will go out of date as as the grid in the countries where these servers are made um, becomes greener. But but you know so far that's the data we have, and I do know that Dell are updating some of their tools so that we'll be able to get much more fine grained information uh, fairly soon. But on on average, you know, um, if we look at Cosmos Seven, it's been in production for about four years so far. Um, Total energy consumption over that time is about 3.2 gigawatt hours. Uh, if we look at the uh, average carbon intensity of northeast, uh, 38 grams CO2 per kilowatt hour. Um, 
work through the maths, then then basically what we find is that um, for the embodied for the for the production CO two the electricity electricity CO two to equal the embodied CO two of one of these servers, we have to run them for eighteen years. That's a long time to run an HPC system for. Now, of course. Um, if we if we uh, look at our fourth year like four year lifetime we've run it for the embodied is actually eighty percent of the carbon emitted, um, and that percentage is only going to increase as the UK national grid greens because we're probably greening faster here than uh, the countries where these servers are made. Uh, now, of course, this calculation does depend on the carbon intensity used, and we are part of a national grid, so so probably using the um, northeast carbon intensity is not necessarily a valid thing to do. Um, if we look at the country as a whole, um, I don't think I've got it on this slide, uh, but if we looked at the country as a whole, I think we find more like a was it eight, 10 year lifetime was was uh, where it was 50 50. Um, we one of the highest areas, the East Midlands. Again, you you your payback is within two and a half years, uh, something like that. OK, next slide, Andy. Uh, yeah, here we are. Here we are. This is. Um, UK national um, grid. So four four year here we are four years operation for um, using the UK national grid would would mean the embodied CO two is equal to the production CO two. Uh, but that that time, as I said, will increase as the grid uh, continues to become greener. And um, so one question we have then is is how long should be we running these systems for? I mean, typically they tend to be run for something like four or five years, maybe maybe even less in some cases. Um, four years, you know, means that 50% of the CO2 is embodied. If you eight years in that case might seem reasonable, you know, uh, of course, there are many factors here, but, uh, you know, over eight years and 33% of the CO2 produced will be um, due to the embodied part. Um, and that's, that's probably a lot longer than we currently do. So one important thing to do here then is to push the suppliers for lower embodied energy. Um, OK, next slide. Right, so as Andy has touched on, um, we UKRI may start looking at uh, charging per kilowatt hour or, or some sort of mix of, of kilowatt hour and node hour type of thing, uh, rather than the core hours that are used currently. And and so so one thing we want to do is give users um, and PIs a knowledge uh, information about how much um, how many kilowatt hours their projects are currently using, so that they can. A, concentrate on making their codes more energy efficient, but also they'll know how much energy to apply for when they're, you know, when they're making applications. So what we do on Cosma um, is we send every quarter, the end of every quarter, we send emails to users and project PIs that specify the total energy that the user's jobs have used. Um, that's based on the compute node usage, an estimate of the fraction of the storage and the fabric you've used. Uh, they look at the carbon intensity over that period, the mass of the CO2 generated, uh, and then we also give some context, you know, flights across the Atlantic or miles driven, household usage, things like that. Um, and then, and then the for per project, we we give uh, the total energy used by each project, which is a PI seat, and uh, a list then of the largest users. So it's easy for the PI to then pick out if there's an unexpectedly large user, they have to think, well, what's that user doing with their time? Okay, next slide. Um, and the same thing is happening in Arch2. They're developing a tool there to, to report this energy to users. Uh, and I think some sort of dashboard there. Um, and you can see some, some out, I wouldn't talk through it because we're short of time, but some sort of uh, information that comes, comes out of this. Okay, I think, is that next slide? I think we're probably there. Yeah, we've been through recommendations and, and it's been through recommendations. Um, so there we are. I see there are a couple of, um questions that have come through in the chat one is about 100 percent renewable energy contracts well i think one one key thing there of course is that if you're on a renewable energy contract if you use more or less energy it doesn't result in um it, it, it doesn't you know because the grid isn't 100 green you know it just use means that someone else who's not on a uh, certified energy contract is using then more carbon intensive forms as you use more of the wind power that's available, that sort of thing. Um, so, you know, as, as, a, as a looking at the UK as a whole, that doesn't necessarily help. Now, of course it does because you pay a bit more, which can then be reinvested in the green energy. So it's obviously a good thing to do, but in terms of CO2 produced, 
uh, long term that probably doesn't help apart apart from that extra money um great thanks alistair and andy um i think i'm very aware that we're running out of time today we've we've underestimated timekeeping as always so um if um we could maybe move over to our next speaker who i think is ag that would be great and I don't know if you, you can see my electrics flashing. My boyfriend is doing some DIY downstairs and it's caused the electrics to flash. So I hope I don't cut out. If I do, I'm sorry. Hello, everybody. Kept oh, first of all, can you hear me? We can hear you. I can see you at your window screen, but not now I can see slides. You can see slides. Okay, Amazing. let's go. So Poppy's asked me to... um cut down and go quickly so I'll do that so this is about mapping the DRI which is um, one of the parts of the work done by the core team and this is work that um, I've been doing largely with um, Gaban and Simon who are both part of the STFC SCD team so the first part of this was um, trying to map the digi UKRI digital research infrastructure um, and mainly we thought of that in terms of facilities, whatever we think of as a facility. So this is gathering information from those facilities and then converting that into some kind of publicly available database, providing some kind of tooling so that we can query it or other people could query it, and then re report on the, the key things that we found and recommendations for the future of this. It's really important that we had community input. So we, we uh, many of you have helped us with the design and the, the testing of the um, survey that we've done. We had a, a brief expert advisory group to tell us about the best way to consider the database issue and the, the query tools. And of course, the community have been helping us with the actual survey itself. So one of the problems is what is the DRI? It's not written down ever, er, anywhere. Um, we might imagine that there are maybe between 200 and 1,000 facilities. There is a DRI infra portal, which has a lot of them in it. Um, that has about 838. But actually, if you start looking to the details of that, um, about half of them are thought of as e-infrastructure and data. And when we actually looked very closely at the records, we identified about 80 that we thought would fit the kind of thing that we would call DRI um, for this project. Through talking to many of you and other contacts, we found about another 50 um, facilities that we made contact with. 50 responded to the survey uh, after many extensions and, and many times that we chased people up. Um, and after analysis, about 48 of those records seemed really relevant to what we were asking. And in terms of the good, uh, those that have got good coverage, um, we are still in the process of analysing and, and looking at what we've learned. Um, so if we think about where we are now, so we, we sent out this survey, um, as many of you have, have helped with, so thank you for all your help with that. And the next stage was to process the results. Um, so doing things like cleaning the data, anonymizing it, um, so that we can have a version that we can make public, um, checking outliers, categorizing and binning um, numerical data, for example. Um, so we've, we've done those parts. Um, we are currently in the process of generating what we call the processed database. And that is something that will be publicly available um, at a persistent URL in an accessible format. Um, and we're also providing some Python, Jupyter notebooks as a way of allowing people to interact with that data. Um, and then finally, we'll move on to generating a final report and the, the final version of the database will be published as Zenodo um, with some information about sort of guidance on usage and, and caveats, et cetera. So one key message before we look at any actual result is that engagement is really hard. And we should think as in terms of recommending how we do things in future that there are some key challenges. So people don't have time to respond. Many people don't have access to the information that, that we are asking for. 
I think maybe some are skeptical about the real impact of this process and that may have caused them not to engage. And also it's quite a manual process, um, which meant people had to come back and or, or they had to do it all at, at once and try and track what was going on. So just thinking about how this kind of thing might be dealt with in future, um, we might take a leaf out of the laboratory efficiency assessment framework book. Um, so this is a, a UCL project, which is about improving the efficiency of um, primarily um, chemical laboratories. Um, but they have a, a web interface that you can have an account on and you can log in and put your information in there. Um, and then you can review it over time and it can be assessed against certain criteria. So some way of actually um, making this making it easier to add this information and update it would make sense. Standardizing on the kind of metrics, the kind of information we're asking for people to collect, I think would be really important. And also potentially a scaled approach. So we sent one survey out to everyone, whether they were managing a small server room in a university or whether they're managing Archer 2. And maybe we need different levels of information required at different scales. And that actually leads us on to a few big questions about how the DRI mapping should happen in future. So do we need to map the complete DRI or might we learn just as much from sampling parts of it and then and modeling and um, predicting the, the overall picture? At the moment, I don't think we can answer that or I can't answer that. Um, and also, how do we get people to engage? So maybe we need to be much more proactive. Um, for example, we could have some kind of funding opportunity for early adopters, um, maybe support for early adopters that include ac included access to tools and best practice advice, um, and maybe getting people involved as community champions or something like that. So on to a few actual results. Um, we're very much in the process. So we, we closed the survey last week. We're very much in the process of just understanding the results at the moment. So in terms of who responded, a, a mixture of people actually on the left hand side with the kind of individuals that responded and they, they represented different kind of institutions. And we had quite a good range of, of the um, cross section of the different research councils. Um, we can look at just a few examples. So there, there might be an opportunity for us to learn more about heat reuse from cooling systems. So when we asked us, do you, is, is the cooling reusing warm air to heat other buildings? Um, virtually everyone said no or don't know, but some parts of the community are doing this and there may be opportunities for, for us to spread the good practice and the knowledge from them. When we asked people if they had control over the purchasing of their energy supply, um, virtually everybody said no, which is quite interesting. Um, and when we asked them about the mixture of whether they, their energy is renewable or non-renewable, there's this um, small sector over here where either 75, well, 75 to 100 percent of the energy is from renewable sources. Um, but there's a whole lot of don't know and a, a lot of no's um, so, and, and very low values. So the take home here is that, that maybe we need much more information flow between the facility managers, um, the, the facility PIs, and the actual energy purchasers and energy managers. And we, we have these people over here that, that can potentially tell us more about how they've achieved this. We've discussed PUE today already. And so a good value of PE is as close to one as possible, because that means high efficiency. Um, Actually, most of our respondees were unable to give us a value. So we, we've got 17 responses from the 50 that came back. Um, and some of those are quite close to zero. One of the interesting things is when we asked them what they thought of P PUE as, as a meaningful way of uh, a meaningful metric, we actually got quite a lot of negative responses. Um, so lots of people said they don't know. But a lot of people said various things about why they didn't particularly trust or value the use of PUE. We asked people about training. Um, we said, do you have a budget for training in relation to your the environmental impact? And pretty much everybody said no to that. Um, when we asked them, does training affect user, user behavior? Um, there's a significant amount that said that was 
that it does, and that's an important thing. So here again is a place where there's potential impact that, that perhaps an in, more of an investment in training, um, maybe more of an investment in training related to the environmental impact, environmental impact could be significant. To take a quick look at some of the, the kind of free text responses that we got, um, these, these were just picked out as being interesting. So various people said that financial um, costs lead purchasing decisions um, rather than any sort of thought about the environmental impact. Um, there was an interesting response about um, the idea of making information public about individual users' carbon footprints. Um, that um, somebody suggested that some researchers will shame their colleagues who have a large carbon footprint. Um, so that was just a, something for us to bear in mind about how these things are communicated and shared in future. Um, there was talk about um, running a pilot and already showing that there's a significant impact on user thinking based on sharing information with them about their carbon footprint. And a couple of um, issues here related to the interaction with vendors. So getting information from vendors and manufacturers that, that's clear, consistent and transparent, and also the fairness and transparency across vendors cloud providers, HPC centers, essentially, to avoid the, the potential for greenwashing and misinformation. And so that's my whistle stop tour. So next steps, we need to complete our analysis. Um, we need to come up with our key findings, um, publish the database and the query tools, and then develop recommendations that will go into the final report on the DRI mapping. And um, this little plot in the bottom right corner um, is just a correlation matrix between some of our results. Um, I don't think we're going to do too much of that because I don't think we have large enough counts for a lot of the, the data that we receive back. And that in itself is a sort of key indication of um, the kind of the, the, the one of the barriers and one of the things that we want to overcome in future with this kind of work. That's me done. Thank you. Amazing. Thanks, Ag. Um, and your timer just went off on my um, alarm, so you timed it perfectly. Um, have we got any questions for Eric? We've probably got time for one or two. John, you've just put your hand up. Uh, yeah, so I think I think mapping the DRI is incredibly difficult, and I do wonder what fraction of the carbon footprint of the DRI can be attributed to all the laptops owned by researchers accessing the, the large facilities. They have a particularly large carbon footprint um, and they may not use much power, but their manufacturing is very energy intensive. And so we may be missing uh, really important aspects of that there. My, in, in, but in terms of mapping it out, my suspicion is that the only way to do it reliably will be to tie it to the funding and keep track of when you, when you spend money on a grant or on a, a, a project that there's a reporting requirement. When you're given the money, there's a string attached that means you must tell them what you've, you've bought. And there'll need to be some you know, practicalities around that, you don't want necessarily 20 page spreadsheets and things, uh, but that might be the only way to get a reliable map. But I think it will still miss, um, I think somebody in the, the comment called them the, the edge devices, which may be really, really significant. Thank you, John. Yeah, the um, I, I know Wim, Wim's done a little bit of work looking at the um, Trying, trying to get a, a, an estimated value for the cost of all individual devices in comparison to the likes of Archer. Um, and we need to do a, a little bit more analysis on that, but, but it looks certainly comparable. Wim, do you want to say anything about that? Well, you've just said uh, the main thing. Um, so yeah, I did an estimate based on um, analyzing a database of machines that, that we have uh, in our own department and then doing interviews with other departments to see whether they had a similar mix and that allowed us to estimate the the total um 
carbon emissions from use of the machines, um, how it relates exactly to uh, the rest of the infrastructure that we should do um, after comparing with ARC's recent data, which I didn't have yet when I made that estimate. But um, my estimate was that there's actually at least as much uh, in laptops and so on than the rest of the DRI. All right. Thank you, everyone. I'm going to have to cut you short because we are very quickly running out of time, I'm afraid, and we've still got one more speaker to go. So we've got um, Simon and Lorna. I think you're doing a tag team. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Yes. Um, right. We're, we're talking about the, uh, the, the case studies. Um, so I'll start off by sharing my screen. Um, Absolutely. Uh, right. Hopefully you can all see see that. So yeah, the, the case studies are uh, intended to be complementary to the DRI mapping exercise that we've just heard about by going into more depth, uh, looking at particular DRIs um, in, in more depth than, than was possible with the, the questionnaire that was sent out. Um, but um, we've taken two very different approaches. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about uh, one of these approaches and Lorna will be talking about the other. Um, so um, so these, these case studies that I'll, I'll be talking about refer to these uh, um, DRIs here, Jasmine, which is, of course is uh, the um, uh, data analysis service for data intensive environmental science um, and then uh, scaffold pike and jade 2 which are two of the high performance computing facilities at the artery center um, so all of these are operated by stfc um, and what we did in the this approach to the case studies is conduct um, semi-structured interviews with the managers or some of the managers of these facilities that is the people who are responsible for um, the uh, running them as a service um, with a view to understanding their their priorities um, uh, their concerns their awareness um, of issues around net zero and what can be done about it um, so uh, we took a systematic approach to developing the uh, interviews and groups the questions into four groups that you can see here. Um, what is known uh, about the way that the DRIs are run? How much information do they have uh, at their disposal uh, about the operation, particularly uh, from an um, uh, environmental carbon emission point of view? Um, what is done, what are the, the, the practices uh, that they uh, adopt um, uh, in, in running um, these facilities, uh, what's the external environment uh, which could refer to uh, the uh, technological developments uh, in, in the future or it could refer to the policy environment, uh, budgetary constraints, uh, things which are outside their direct control that are likely to have an impact on the way that the facilities are run. Uh, and finally, a group of questions about uh, user communities. Um, so here's a, um, just a, a, a short extract uh, from one of the interview summaries. This is the group A, what is known? So the first question is, what do you currently measure or monitor? And then the first sub question is relating to sources of the energy you consume. Um, and uh, this is a, a summary of uh, one of the discussions we had uh, um, with one of the infrastructure managers. That's to give you an, an idea of, of how, how it went. Um, the analysis process um, went like this. We, we conducted the interviews using this uh, uh, structured template, as I, I said, uh, wrote up summary notes um, and then on the basis of those notes conducted a SWOT analysis that stands for strengths, weaknesses, opportunities and threats, um, which seem to be um, a useful way of um, breaking down and analysing the responses from the facilities managers. Uh, and then um, what we did was to align those uh, and to group them together um, to try and give some kind of um, uh, overall perspective. Now, of course, because we're not dealing with uh, a, a large number of, of infrastructures in these case studies, uh, in fact, it's a, a very small number, uh, there's, there's a limit to um, 
the representativeness of the conclusions we can draw, but hopefully there's some kind of cross validation possible because uh, Jasmine is very different from the from the other two. Um, so we were looking for, for commonalities, we were looking for alignment and grouping between these strengths, weaknesses, opportunities and threats. Uh, and the final step, which is still in progress, is seeking conclusions and recommendations. Um, and of course, of SWOT actually is quite well adapted to that because um, strengths are things you want to continue, uh, opportunities you want to try to make real threats you want to guard against. So that naturally leads itself to recommendations. But um, that's a, a work in progress. Um, however, here's a, a few observations. Um, that we we can make uh, um, from from the analyses we've done at the at the moment um, that we find that there is generally a comprehensive level of power monitoring available. Uh, in other words, there's quite a lot of data, um, but not necessarily uh, at an actionable level um, for various reasons. Um, the uh, management of the digital research infrastructures is kind of disconnected from the sources of energy, which tend to be negotiated as a higher level of the organization, certainly in the case of STFC. Um, there's also something of a, a disconnection from users and their behavior, because the people that we spoke to are responsible for running the facility as a service and not necessarily uh, for the way in which users uh, employ it. Um, so, I mean, for, in the sense of, you know, where, how they run their jobs with the efficiency of their jobs. Um, there was a great deal of awareness of, of opportunities, um, local sources of energy, um, possibility of, of using excess heat, um, but limited ability to implement that. Um, the same point for um, opportunities for technological developments, um, that there are strong constraints arising from, from budgets, uh, principally budget cycles, um, which mean that those opportunities cannot always be turned into reality. Um, and uh, interestingly, there was re remarks about the, the lack of a visible knowledge base and knowledge sharing on data center design. Uh, I mean, clearly there is a lot of knowledge out there, but uh, it's not systematically captured um, in a usable form. Uh, so that's not meant to be a comprehensive list of, of observations, um, and, um, but this is the kind of thing that's emerging from the analysis uh, that we're doing of these interviews, um, which I think will be nicely complementary with results coming out from elsewhere in the project. Um, so at this point I'll hand over to Lorna um, who's going to talk about the other side of the case study uh, which is actually quite different in nature. Lorna over to you. Thank you yes uh, let's see sharing and okay can people see those my slides? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to talk to you about the case study we've carried out on Archer 2, and I want to acknowledge my colleagues, Alan Simpson, Andy Turner, uh, Turner and Laura Moran, who've all been heavily involved in this work. And I think at least Andy and Alan are on the call. Um, so for those who don't know Archer 2, it's the UK's National HPC Service serving um, EPS, EPSRC and NERT remit. And it's recently been extended, so it'll be running at the moment until November 2025. Um, it represents a 10 times increase in performance from the Archer service. So it's a significant improvement for our researchers. The system is hosted by ourselves, EPCC, and operated by EPCC. And we house it at our advanced computing facility in Edinburgh. The system consistently runs at about 90% utilization um, and we have around 3000 active uh, user accounts um, at the moment. So it's, it's, it's a heavily used machine. So, so we were asked to look at a case study uh, around Archer 2. And so I have a number of points to raise. The first, there's been some interesting chat around renewable energy tariffs already. I am on. I can. I've seen it in the in the chat and around. I am, and it's true. Um, you'll see Michelle comment that the University of Edinburgh is on a renewable energy tariff. However, um, as Andy mentioned, it's still important to be looking to reduce the overall electricity usage of this system. Um, looking at reducing the load on the grid, 
I am and freeing up renewable capacity for other people, um, as well as reducing our overall requirements for cooling. So what we've been looking at is a range of areas, and I can't cover them all today, but I've picked out some highlights. We've been looking at understanding the power draw by different components inside the system. Um, we've been reviewing some of the best practice uh, carried out by other places. In particular, there's been a series of PRACE infrastructure workshops um, around sustainability. So this is looking at best practice across HPC sites um, in Europe, um, and we'll be providing a summary of that. We've been looking at strategies to reduce energy consumption, and I'll have a, I'll mention a few key highlights there. And also looking at highlighting some of the best practices that we employ in the advanced computing facilities, such as our free cooling. Um, there's quite a lot of link to the work that was reported by the HPC Jeep project, project. And we've been looking at ways in which we can influence, um, potentially influence user behavior in terms of um, energy efficiency. So I think one of the things to raise here is that we have um, good energy monitoring tools, um, both at the, the ACF level, um, at the system level, you know, at Archer 2, and also all the way down to monitoring um, usage by individual job, which allows us to understand what's going on at the user level. One of the areas we have found challenging um, is understanding the carbon emissions associated with manufacturing. Um, we have been trying to extract information on this from the hardware vendors, um, but haven't managed to extract anything here. It's a significant area that I think needs further investigation. Um, and one of the things that also I think is important is to place this work in the context of the value of the service. So um, I saw Martin put a comment in the chat I, about you know uh, the the energy consumption of Archer Two, um, but Archer Two is an important service for the user community. Um, it provides a great deal of world leading science, um, and you know it's important to understand the value of that 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 service brings. Uh, okay, so uh, one of the highlights we have is around um, uh, free cooling on Archer Two. So by free cooling, I, what I mean here is passive cooling. So this is when the active chillers are not in operation. So in our case, um, water is pumped up to the roof of the ACF. Um, and we benefit, of course, from the fact that we're further north than many of you. So we get some um, natural cooling here from the um from the air from the you know the air temperature. We've recently carried out some work, um, or HPE have recently carried out some work to replace the coolant um, in Archer 2. This has allowed Archer 2 to operate at a higher temperature. Um, and we are currently working um, on the corresponding efforts to um, increase the facility water temperature, um, which should reduce the overall um, amount of or, or should increase the amount of free cooling that's available to us at the ACF. So basically reduce the electricity consumption from the chiller units. So it's an interesting uh, example of how um, a specific change to the system um, is impacting on, um, is having a direct impact on our electricity usage. Another thing we've been looking at um, is we've been looking at the um, processor clock frequency, the processor frequency. Um, we, it was currently clocked at, or in December, it was clocked at 2.25 gigahertz. And I know time is tight, so I won't go into a huge amount of detail here, but what we found having looked at a series of um, the big applications was that by reducing the clock, um, clock frequency slightly, uh, we maintained um, a very similar level of performance. So we weren't lo losing particular performance, but we were obviously reducing our overall um, energy. So we did this for a series of applications. It doesn't apply to all of them, Gromax being a good example of where um, we saw something different, um, but it, it gave us confidence that um, an overall change could indeed impact on our um, overall um, energy usage. So what we did is um, on the 12th of December last year, we reduced um, the processor frequency to two gigahertz. 
And as you can see, this is the standard monitoring we do. Um, we went, we dropped by about 0.5 of a megawatt. Um, what we did was, this has been applied across um, all, all codes, all users, um, with users having the option to select the higher frequency if they wish. And for some of the applications that we knew we aren't going to benefit benefit from this. We we updated the the frequency manually as well. So the result is that we've seen the power draw in Archer two reduced by around twenty percent from this change. Um, and we're continuing to monitor this. We haven't had um, particular concern from users over any kind of performance issues. So it's been a a, a win here. So um, just a few summaries and conclusions. Um, I noticed, well, I pointed out before that um, we're on a renewable energy tariff, but there is still value, obvious value to trying to reduce our overall energy consumption. Um, I think it's also worth noting that we were able to make a significant reduction in our, in our power consumption um, without impacting significantly on performance and also without requiring individual users to modify their software tool. So users didn't need to make individual changes here to achieve this. Um, we also saw that, you know, replacing the coolant made a, a significant, uh, is, is likely to make a significant difference to, um, uh, to our energy consumption. So there, there are examples here that we've been able to take action um, on, a, on an operating service, a service that's running you know, at significant usage and uh, achieve real, real benefit. And the report on this will be out in February. I think that's me. Yep.